All right. Hello, everybody. I know we have a lot um, to discuss on this panel today, so I'm just going to dive in and assume that folks will be trickling into the room as they leave the keynote um, presentation. Uh, thank you so much for joining us in this digital space for a panel discussion about Alaska salmon and those who depend on it. I am joining from Danaina, Athlana this afternoon, though I live and fish most often on traditional Supiak lands. First, I'll go over some quick housekeeping asks. Um, please keep your mics muted. Time is limited and we have a lot of perspectives to hear. So we ask that you share questions in the chat box on Zoom or in the questions feature on Whova and please keep the tone respectful. We will try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of the panel. But before I introduce myself and kick off the discussion, we have the privilege of receiving an invocation from Father Sergius Chaknuk. Father Sergius, uh, welcome and thank you for this offering. I'll pass it to you. Thank you very much. Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, you who are everywhere present and filling all things, treasure of blessings and giver of life. Come make yourself live within us and guide us in all good things through your holy name. We ask this, that you will guide all right, the decisions, thoughts, and the concerns that is presented here today in a very graceful and loving manner that together with our will, we may align our personal wills with your holy name in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Father Sergius. My name is Marissa Wilson, and I am honored to serve as the Executive Director of the Alaska Marine Conservation Council. AMCC is a nonprofit started nearly 30 years ago to advocate for the integrity of marine ecosystems and the health of communities that depend on them by recognizing the ecological importance of small scale place based harvester stewards in our ocean commons. I also serve on the board of directors for the Alaska Food Policy Council and thank them along with the Intertribal Agriculture Council and UAA School of Allied Health for the phenomenal energy that they have put into the offering this festival of connection. I want to acknowledge also that there are many forms of relationship that people have with salmon. I ask that everyone arrive to this space with compassion for each other and ask you to join me in taking a deep mindful breath to ground ourselves in gratitude for the finned kin that bring us here. Today, I am serving as a co-moderator with Brad Angason, who will be speaking as a panelist as well, and who coordinated this panel and put together these slides. Thank you very much, Brad. Um, and now I am going to step back and watch the clock and do my best to keep us on schedule. Brad, please take it away. Yeah, thank you, Marissa. I really appreciate that. Okay, well, first of all, uh, before anything, uh, I'd like to, to thank you all for carving time out of your, your weekend schedule to participate and listen to this uh, panel presentation. We've got some, some great participants today who have uh, you know, a multitude of perspectives. Um, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm actually going to um, do some creative uh, restructuring of the agenda, Marissa. I'm going to move to the back of the agenda. And if we have time, I'll, I'll proceed with my, uh, uh, my perspective. Um, but before anything, let's, uh, let's kind of explore why we're here today. Uh, for many Alaskans, salmon is much more than a novelty or a trophy. It's a significant food source. Each of the participants in this panel, to some degree or another, are impacted significantly by the sustainability of salmon. 
Salmon has been a staple of protein for Alaskans since time immemorial. We've all heard that expression many times over, and it's true. In some parts of Alaska, salmon runs are flourishing and experiencing record returns. Yet in other parts, salmon are struggling to return from year to year, leaving many to wonder how they'll be able to adequately harvest this once abundant natural resource to feed their families. Years ago, it was unfathomable to think salmon food security in certain parts of Alaska could ever be in peril for future generations, but yet here we are today. Today, we'll hear some discussion on the historic significance of salmon in certain parts of Alaska, as well as suspected causes and impacts leading up to poor or critical salmon stock returns. We'll hear from those who depend on this vital protein in a traditional diet, in this effort, we're working to increase awareness of issues impacting our salmon resources and to consider the depth of resolve to bring salmon back to healthy, sustainable returns and to keep salmon healthy and sustainable in areas where returns are abundant. In our effort to draw awareness to Alaska salmon as Alaska's food security, we are collaborating the general public and various salmon user groups from around the state with management and policymakers. And that's what we're doing here today. Our first, our first speaker, I'd like to invite uh, Commissioner Douglas Vincent Lang. Uh, Doug Vincent Lang is Commissioner of Alaska Department of Fish and Game and has been with the department for 34 years. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology, Population Dynamics from the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, with a Master of Science degree in Bi Biological Oceanography from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Doug Vincent Lang lives in Anchorage with his wife of 35 years. He has three children and is teaching his granddaughter to fish, hunt, and enjoy the abundance of Alaska. Uh, Commissioner Lang, the floor is yours. Thank you for coming oh. today. Well, thank you, thank you all, and, and good afternoon. And again, thank you for the opportunity to discuss how wild fish and wildlife are really important elements of food security for Alaskans. I think if we learned anything from COVID, it was how vulnerable our state is to disruptions in food supply. Food shelves really across Alaska were bare and supplies were in short supply. This was especially true across rural Alaska. Alaskans became aware of just how dependent we are on food deliveries for our survival. In essence, we have less than a week's supply of some food items, especially perishable items. Without resupply, shortages did occur, and they could definitely occur into the future. I think if at the end of this, this has all resulted in an increased awareness surrounding the issue of food securities across our state. In response, Governor Dunleavy has issued an administrative order establishing a food security task force to evaluate this issue and make recommendations regarding how best to increase our state's food security. We are actively seeking members on this task force. And if any of you are interested in serving, please apply through the Office of Boards and Commission in the Governor's Office. The Alaska Legislature is also considering establishing a task force to address this issue. I think why we're here today is we all recognize that one element of food security is the importance of our wild populations of fish and game resources to Alaskans. Alaskans directly harvest fish and game through subsistence, personal use, sport, and hunting regulations. They also access these resources by purchasing commercially harvested Alaskan seafood products. Last week, I saw direct marketing of cod fillets. Also in most coastal communities, one can directly purchase Alaskan seafoods at the dock. We need to explore more options for making Alaska commercially caught salmon available throughout Alaska. So how do we ensure that fish and game can continue to be a sustainable element of Alaska's food security? This is underscored by the recent declines in Chinook statewide and chum salmon in the AYK region. In some cases, we are not able to provide for subsistence opportunity, a top priority for the uses of fish and game across our state. Under Alaska's constitution and statutes, we are required to manage for sustained yield. This is unique amongst the 50 states, and it's something that we take seriously. We have built a fast and well-respected statewide research and management program that's focused on long-term sustainability of our resources and the benefits our fish and wildlife resources have to Alaskans, including food security. 
towards ensuring sustainability, we find ourselves in the situation where, where when unfortunately there are not enough returning fish for the spawning grounds to safeguard future generations of salmon, we are bound to restrict or close fisheries. I can tell you this is not an easy decision, especially when it comes to subsistence and personal use fisheries, as it impacts food security and sociocultural practices of Alaskans. But we cannot jeopardize long-term sustained yield when stocks are far below levels needed for the spawning grounds. We also recognize the impact that commercial closures have on food security. Commercial fisheries are vitally important. The cash many residents gain through commercial fishing frequently offsets the increasing cost of fuel, boats, and other gear that are needed to hunt and fish. It's all intertwined and we recognize this. It is important to place any year's poor returns in perspective and understand that fish and wildlife productivity can be cyclical and that we have seen low periods of productivity in the past. For example, we have seen extremely low levels of chum productivity in Western Alaska this year. Yes, these have been some of the lowest returns on record, but we have seen lower returns in the past and have recovered from them based on our sustained yield principle. Chum and Chinook salmon AYK crashed in the 1990s and rebounded in the early to mid 2000s. It is why we enacted closures to allow the stocks to sustain themselves through these cycles. But that does not help in the short term and we recognize it. While we understand that nothing can replace traditional subsistence fishing activities, the governor's office and ADF and G took steps to mitigate some of those impacts and will continue to do so. In partnership with other groups, we are distributing salmon to impacted communities last year and are considering additional distributions to address future food shortage issues. Again, while we recognize that nothing can replace the ability to participate in traditional subsistence activities, we are hopeful that these fish will at least partially offset some of the lost food. We are prepared, prepared again to distribute fish in the event that fishing closures are necessary to protect the sustainability of, of AYK stocks into the future. We are also investing heavily in trying to determine the causes of the low productivity. We can go into this more detail if you wish, but, it, but no, as a department, we are examining issues related to a changing climate as well as changing oceanographic conditions. Unfortunately, these answers are not easy and will take some time to emerge. We are also exploring options to augment these runs through hatchery enhancement. However, we do not want to repeat the experiences of hatchery releases in the Columbia River. We must be careful and, and thoughtfully consider how to do this. We also have treaty implications that must be considered in certain areas of the state. That said, we are taking steps to evaluate the viability of enhancement as a potential tool to increase fishing opportunity and food security. We are also extending hunting seasons where possible and where it does not impact the long-term sustainability of the wildlife resources. I've directed my staff to explore additional opportunities that are available. Speaking of hunting, the department is taking steps to increase the production and survival of ungulates through, through intensive management programs authorized under the state's intensive management statute. This program is working and we're examining ways to increase production, especially in the Mulchatna herd. We're also looking to increase hunting opportunities through large mammal introduction programs. We successfully introduced wood bison into the Inoko region and are negotiating an agreement to release more wood bison in the Mitchell Flats area. We're also exploring options to release deer and sheep, all focused on increasing food security for Alaskans. Finally, we must maintain access to our resources. As the Arctic opens, we must explore opportunities to develop fisheries and community development quota programs. Other nations will begin to exploit these resources and we must be ready to use them also. We also must also maintain and increase responsible access to our fish and wildlife resources across our state. This includes on federal lands where Anilka, Alaskans were guaranteed responsible access to our fish and game resources. The other piece that no one is talking about is stability. We need stability. We need to stabilize our food supply. We want to increase reliability of food resources. That also includes port and infrastructure and transportation infrastructure. With that said, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have and again, on behalf of Governor Dunleavy and myself, thank you for the, uh, the invitation to participate in this meeting. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Marissa, I, I'm not paying attention to the chat. I, I, I've seen some activity 
in the chat room, um, do we have any questions from the general public that uh, that we might have time for? And this is in the interest of uh, of of uh, letting the commissioner off the hook here, given that he's he's got a bit of a day ahead of him. Yes, um, I'll start with one that I see on the uh, Hoover. Um, somebody asked, "What are?" three likely theories for the continuing decline in Chinook salmon stocks in the Yukon River drainage system. So we're trying to explore that. There, there's one reason could be, we know we're, we have treaty obligations in the Yukon River. The Chinook salmon in the Yukon River are, are under a Pacific Salmon Treaty because most of the Chinook salmon spawn in Canada. So we have passage objectives. And we know in many cases that we're passing enough fish at our lower river sonar, but for some reason they're not making as adults past our upper river sonar close to the Canadian border. That may <clears> be <throat> due to ichthyophonus and, and other diseases in the river. So we've instituted a study now to put radio telemetry tags on some of the Schnook salmon that are taken in a pilot station to find out what, what the fate of those fish are before they get to the Canadian border. The second thing we're noticing with, with Chinook salmon in the Yukon River is something that's happening statewide. We're seeing Chinook salmon have relatively poor ocean conditions. We're putting generally enough fish on the beds that we should be able to get a reasonable return, but something's happening in the ocean. And we're starting to piece that together. We have a study in the North Bering Sea that looks at the, the survival rates of Chinook salmon in that first month, month and a half when they emigrate out from the from the Yukon River and into, into the marine waters. And we're finding out that that first month and a half is a very critical time for Chinook salmon and, and, and determining their ultimate survival in the ocean. And we're starting to piece that together. We're, we're hoping through a capital project that we, have, that we have in play at the legislature to extend that work into the Southern Bering and into the North Gulf of Alaska. And then finally, you know, we, we also know that the Chinook salmon are, are having a hard time out in the ocean. We know that as climate changes, the ocean warms, and as the ocean warms, we, we see that the zooplankton composition in the water column changes, and it basically temperatures. And as and, and fish are cold-blooded, so as, as, as the ocean warms, their, their, their thermodynamic needs go up. These basically they need more, more food to basically survive those warmer temperatures. Well, the food you're eating is less nutritious that's taking a toll on king salmon out in the ocean. So, you know, we we have dedicated money through the Pacific Salmon Treaty and through the North Pacific Research Board to participate in the International Year of the Salmon. And I think we're starting to piece together what's happening out in the deep blue ocean. So hopefully as the temperature regime shifts and we're seeing some promises that, that it is shifting back to a cooler temperature, they will start seeing a turnaround in these ocean survival conditions and hopefully get greater productivity coming back. Thank you, Commissioner. I've got a, a, a quick question for you. Is there a correlation between um, the, the, the few chums that return back to Bristol Bay and, and the, the, the chums that aren't returning back to the Cusquequim? Is there, is there an explanation for that? Yeah, we're trying to really piece that one together because in the case of chums in the Cuscoquim and the Yukon River, we were surprised this year. We had put enough chums on the spawning beds that we should have seen chum numbers that were sufficient to not only meet spawning objectives, but also to provide some subsistence. And we were surprised at the low levels of returns that came back, actually uh, the collapse. And, you know, we know that these chums go out into the Bering Sea. Um, we're trying to piece together what caused, we, we think it's not a freshwater issue. We don't think that we had, you know, a major die off in, in freshwater systems. We think we had something happen in the ocean. And we're, again, we're trying to piece that together. Um, we know that chums have the same dietary needs of many other fish out in the ocean, like cod, pollock, and sablefish. And and, and there's a lot of sable fish in the ocean right now and cod numbers are increasing and, and they're not only eating the same thing that, that chums eat, they also are eating juvenile chums. Um, we also know that, that chums, unlike a lot of those cods, have different energetic needs and, and have, probably have higher energetic needs. 
they simply may have lost the competitive advantage in the in the ocean to to some of these other species. But right now we're still speculating, but we're, we're we have to have some hypotheses to run out run after to try to track this down as to what's happening. Understood. I I appreciate uh, your response, Commissioner. And again, I thank you for carving time out of your your day for us. Um, yeah, and, and I'm going to hang around for at least another half an hour, 45 minutes. So I, I'm interested in hearing some of the other presentations. And if you have other questions, feel free. I'm, oh, you, know. you bet. You bet. Yeah. Well, thank you very much again. Yeah. I just want to let people know we 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 are taking. We're trying to figure this out. And unfortunately, science is not always as quick as, as people want it to be, but you know, we're, we're trying to piece the puzzle pieces together to try to get a more complete picture of what's happening so we can better focus our research on, I mean, our management to, to ensure that we have sustained runs. Um, I'll amplify um, if, I, if I may, um, there's uh, one question that was entered pretty early into the chat for the commissioner here. Um, and there's some lead into it, but effectively the question is, how do we get a dedicated seat for an indigenous subsistence user on the Board of Fish? Well, the first thing that you have to do is get some get names into the boards and commissions on interested people to serve. So you, you can't get you can't serve if you're not applying. So I'm not going to guarantee that 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 the governor will select from a, a, an indigenous person, but they can't select from them if nobody's applying. So please put your names in and, and get them into boards and commissions because if you're not if you're not on the bench, you can't be called into the game. Marissa, are there any other uh, questions in chat that I'm not seeing? Um, we're coming up right about on our 15 minute mark. Um, there is one question from the audience um, pointing to uh, trawl bycatch as, as a concern um, for salmon returns and um, wondering um, if the commissioner could speak on that. Yeah, so trawl bycatch is one of the factors that could be contributing to the um, low returns of, of um, chum salmon to the Yukon River. But remember, most of the chums that are caught as bycatch are, are juvenile fish, not adult fish. So, you know, when we're talking, you know, we're missing on the order of 1.8 million chums into the Yukon River. We think that when you do it, when you piece all together, the known information we have with chum bycatch in, in the trawl fisheries, we might be potentially tens of thousands, maybe a little bit more than that, but not significantly more than that, or of Yukon origin that are going in, that, that were intercepted as bycatch a couple of years ago. So yeah, it, it's a contributing factor, but it is not what we consider to be the primary culprit in, in trying to figure out what's happening with, with um, Yukon chums and, and Cusco chums. And I would say that we have very good coverage, observer coverage in the US fleet. You know, we have very good, um, genetic information from the chums that are caught because they all, all, all salmon need to be retained so that we can get samples out of them. But that question is also- Well, that's being a good addressed segue. By the, by, oh, real quick, that, that, that question is also being addressed by the um, by a subcommittee that's formed under the, the governor's bycatch task force. And we have a Western Alaska salmon group that's looking at, looking at the bycatch issue. So get involved in that group if, you're, if you have interest. And Commissioner, um, to take you up on your invitation, uh, uh, just really quickly, uh, if, if people are interested in, in, in responding to or applying for boards and commissions, uh, where's the best place to find that information? Um, it's, it can be found on the governor's website under boards and commissions. It's, it's under... I can, I'll, I'll see if I can find the website. I don't know how to do chat, but I'll try to put, put it in the chat, chat box here. But if you go to the governor, state of Alaska's governor's website, you'll see boards and commissions listed underneath there. You can do an application. And Courtney Enright in the governor's office is the person to contact if you want to have questions. Well enough. Okay. Commissioner, thank you very much. We're going to transition over to our next speaker. Um, it's a good segue. 
um, from where you're leading off there, Mr. Rudy Sakata. Uh, if you're if you're if you're on, yeah, um, can you hear me, Brad? I can. And let me introduce you really quickly, Rudy. Rudy is Chief Operating Officer of Coastal Village Region Front Fund, a CDQ group. Rudy moved to Kenai, Alaska in 1971. He graduated from Kenai Central High School and then went on to receive his Bachelor of Arts in Economics and an MBA, both from Cornell University. Rudy's passion are his two children and personal use fishing. Rudy, the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, um, thank you uh, for this opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Rudy Sakata. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Coastal Villages Region Fund. It is a community development quota group that represents 20 villages in the lower Kuskokwim Delta area. And it's actually a good segue. Uh, we do, uh, in the past, many of the communities, uh, the CDQs represent 65 total communities in Western Alaska, representing about 30,000 people. And those folks uh, prior to 1992 would look out into the Bering Sea and uh, wonder what the economic activity was. What is the diversity of fish out there? Um, you know, that's, that's above and beyond their subsistence needs. And, and of course, to our uh, stakeholders, salmon is uh, of the utmost importance. But uh, as, as was uh, kind of introduced by the question on bycatch, the, the CDQ, the Community Development Quota Groups, we do operate uh, Pollock trawlers. Uh, in fact, Coastal Villages Region Fund is the proud operator of a 300 plus foot Pollock trawler that employs 130 folks and distributes. Uh, it is the mainstay that uh, helps us distribute over $15 million worth of economic development efforts in our 20 communities on a yearly basis. And so we are very much in the middle of this situation. As the commissioner pointed out, uh, uh, most of the science appears to be pointing toward things like climate change and ocean survivability, but there is no denying that the Pollock fleet does catch uh, salmon as bycatch. And uh, we do take that seriously. And because our stakeholders each of our board members are residents from the 20 Western communities. And so you can imagine that they are very interested in the, very, uh, the various levels of bycatch. We, are, um, we do operate uh, catcher processors in the offshore fleet. Uh, it is one of the cleaner sectors, but once again, we do contribute to the salmon bycatch. Uh, just as uh, an example, uh, during this current A season, uh, January through March, uh, we landed something on the order of 40 million pounds of Pollock, and uh, we did uh, uh, bycatch 116 kings Chinook salmon during that time. Um, the, there is a Chinook salmon hard cap that we are not allowed to exceed, and uh, that number was something on the order, we were allowed to take something on the order of 878, 880 uh, Chinooks. But uh, we, of course, uh, try to keep that as low as possible. And we feel that by having these fisheries, uh, the participation of the fisheries that are owned by these regional and Western Alaska communities, that uh, we can put uh, quite a bit of pressure on our captains to fish clean. And uh, we do do that. Whereas for profit-driven companies that don't have an economic development stake in Western Alaska, for example, um, if I had 880 Chinook that I was allowed to catch as a trawler and I only caught 116, a fair question from uh, potentially from the shareholders might be, if you caught 800, could you have caught more Pollock more efficiently? And the answer is perhaps that is possible. And so it's kind of a number that these folks try to stay under Whereas one of the beautiful aspects of the community development quota groups is because of their governance by communities that are affected by salmon, uh, we, we try to minimize, even if it was one, we would try to minimize that. Uh, the community development quota groups as well, uh, not only coastal villages, we all uh, work to mitigate uh, these types of salmon bycatch coastal villages. We use a three-pronged approach utilizing science. We have folks uh, on the National uh, Pacific Research Board. 
Uh, we minimize it through operations. Our Pollock trawler has uh, several hundred thousand dollar camera, live camera systems. Uh, we use excluders. We have teamed up with uh, groups like the Ocean Cluster, Bering Sea Fishermen's Association, as well as the Denali Commission to do further studies on uh, lights and uh, excluder technology that will help us minimize the salmon bycatch. Also, as you might suspect, uh, there are a lot of different ways that uh, bycatch can be reduced, but there's always a balancing act. Um, one example, uh, there's inshore pollock and offshore pollock. Uh, just by the nature of Chinook salmon, offshore pollock fleet catches uh, fewer uh, fish than the inshore pollock fleet because uh, Chinook tend to uh, aggregate near shore. Uh, but if we were to move those pollock offshore, it would uh, help the salmon bycatch potentially, but it would certainly hurt the Aleutian Island communities that uh, depend on fish taxes. Uh, places like Dutch Harbor certainly come to mind. And so that is a balancing act, I believe, that uh, we all need to look at. So if we, we, continue, we constantly try to minimize our bycatch, but we are also looking at longer term things. You heard the commissioner say that ocean survivability rates, climate change, uh, other scientists I've heard of uh, uh, mentioned things like the warming blob that uh, has contributed to the decline, not only in salmon, but in other stocks as well. And because of that, uh, um, if we're gonna extract protein resources from the Bering Sea, uh, we're pretty pleased to uh, uh, know that uh, the Pollock fishery has one of the most, the lowest carbon footprint of any uh, protein source. Uh, it's probably four times lower than chicken, uh, five times lower than things like pork, it's only three, four percent of the carbon footprint uh, per kilogram for beef, for example. So in the long run, if we want to try to mitigate things like climate change, that is not only impacting the fisheries of Western Alaska, but uh, really the survivability of many of our communities, uh, we are already starting to see climate refugees. Uh, it sounds like some kind of third world uh, moniker, but it's happening here in Alaska where we have folks that uh, are losing runways, losing schools due to things like climate change and the lack of permafrost. And so we wanna make sure that that uh, is also addressed as well um, in the salmon. We appreciate the, the governor's task force and their willingness to look at all different types of bycatch and incidental catch. Uh, despite the fact that we feel that uh, we do a very good job of minimizing our bycatch, uh, we do have communities, Hooper Bay, Scammon Bay, Chivac, and the northern communities where they were not even allowed one salmon. So certainly, even though we could be proud of the fact that we minimize bycatch, that is no justification to, uh, you will certainly not hear us defending that. And every day we work constantly to try to reduce that. But we also need to make sure we look and address all different uh, levels of bycatch. The Pollock fishery, because of its large volumes, uh, 1.4 billion pounds, I believe, in total, certainly does contribute to the salmon bycatch and bycatch issues all around. But on a percentage basis, it does appear to be uh, one of the cleaner ones. And once again, uh, uh, we will con continue to try to improve upon that. But it is uh, something that we need to note. Even in my sports fishing, I do quite a bit of sports fishing off of a kayak. Sounds pretty green, sounds pretty productive. But even then, halibut I pull up, no matter how careful I am, there's probably something on the order of a 4 to 7% mortality rate. We need to ensure things like uh, fisheries that uh, may be uh, catching fish that uh, are headed up to these rivers. Uh, some of the bycatch intercept fisheries uh, that we see in other areas probably need to be monitored uh, for the impact as well. But really, um, I, I will leave with the thought that uh, at Coastal Villages and the Community Development Quota Groups, we are working very hard to Alaskanize the fishery. And we feel that that is one of the best ways to, uh, to mitigate bycatch of salmon and to bring up the priority of, uh, of this issue uh, into the large Pollock fleets. Because once again, 
My board members, each of the 20 uh, board members come from a small community in Western Alaska. And certainly uh, their emphasis on this low salmon return into the AYK region is something that is a, a major cause of concern. However, we would hope that uh, instead of it being an emotionally driven issue, that we can rely on the science that uh, we are seeing. Because uh, once again, as the commissioner pointed out, uh, there were, you know, we are a part of the bycatch problem. But even if you were to stop uh, all the trawl fleet, uh, as the commissioner pointed out, the, it wouldn't be enough to open up that fishery. And, and uh, not only would we not gain the benefit of the salmon, uh, resources in the Bering Sea, but uh, we would not uh, be able to have the Pollock crab or other benefits uh, transferred over into our 20 communities as well. So we look forward to uh, hearing the concerns. We look forward to researching the science. And uh, despite the fact that we uh, understand that we are a small part of this bycatch issue, uh, we pledge the moving forward that uh, we will be working with groups like the Cuscoquam River Intertribal Fish Commission. Uh, we just had a meeting with uh, Ms. Peltola uh, of that group, and uh, we share a common goal uh, of making sure that uh, we have uh, sufficient subsistence returns for our stakeholders in the AYK region. So uh, I'm happy to try to answer any questions on that. Uh, uh, once again, um, we think we're in a kind of a middle position here where we have uh, both uh, constituents that are relying on subsistence salmon, but uh, my stakeholders that I represent also benefit from uh, some of the Bering Sea fisheries that may contribute at least in some small part uh, to this issue. So uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to share some of the information that we have. And I look forward to uh, hearing what the other speakers may have to say uh, on this issue as well. Thanks, Rudy. Marissa, do we have anybody in chat? Have any questions come through in chat? I, I see some activity going on there, but I'm, I'm not really tracking that. I'm, I'm happy to, uh, yeah, I'm happy to translate here. So there, I see one clarifying question and I'll tack on a, a question that I have to that for the uh, sake of time. Um, somebody was looking to clarify, Rudy, some of those figures that you shared about Chinook bycatch. Um, they're wondering if that was just from one vessel or the entirety of the fleet. And I'm, I'm also curious if there's uh, any knowledge of the number of Chinook that go through those excluders. And you're on mute, Rudy, sorry. The numbers that I gave were from the one vessel that uh, we operate in the fleet. Uh, the bycatch for the entire uh, Pollock fleet is uh, considerably higher because uh, once again, uh, we catch about 100 million pounds out of the 1.4 billion, I believe that's uh, out there. And so uh, those particular figures were from one boat. Uh, and what was the other question that I saw here? Oh, um, and I'm sorry, what was your follow-up after that uh, question? Where's that? If, if there was any knowledge of the number of Chinook that go through the excluders in that uh, modified it, year. Um, that is one of the things that we are currently studying. We believe that at least in some of the test results that I have seen conducted by some of the ground fish forum, uh, they believe that uh, we have escapement rates of 35 to 40% uh, in the excluders, but we're trying to increase that by using things like uh, changing speed, camera systems, active excluder systems. We've also, uh, there are some research that shows that lights can attract uh, Chinook salmon into uh, the escapement pod. So uh, uh, that uh, is currently being studied, but uh, right now some of the numbers show uh, some promising numbers that even when they come into the net, they can get 35 to 40% of the fish out and uh, that number is consistently rising. Thank you. And then one final question. Um, what are the practical steps to Alaskanize your fleet? Well, certainly um, I'm a little bit biased because I am a, a member of the community development quota groups. These 65 Western communities uh, are not only on the Bering Sea and impacted by them, uh, but uh, these types of salmon uh, issues um, uh, certainly direct impact them directly. So what we would like to see is uh, these uh, communities and CDQ groups uh, given the opportunity 
to purchase uh, this type of quota. We would like to make sure that uh, single large individual uh, corporations uh, cannot uh, dominate uh, the fisheries, for example. I think there's uh, several large companies um, that it, as the fisheries consolidate, uh, uh, it moves into kind of forever hands. Uh, large corporations will hold fish forever, but so will CDQ groups and uh, these villages. So I would like to see the council uh, give uh, more flexibility to the community development quota groups. I love the way that uh, they are looking into community quota entities. So uh, the communities that did not get into the community development quota program in 92, they have an opportunity to purchase uh, quota. And I would like to see the continued efforts uh, that I've seen at the state and uh, other agencies uh, that uh, promote uh, younger fishermen uh, getting in uh, to these fisheries. Alaskanizing the fisheries is probably the single largest step we could take to make sure that uh, uh, the stakeholders here in Alaska get really the right say in the fisheries. Thank you, Rudy. And then I think for the sake of time, Brad, we should move on to our next panelist. And um, for participants listening, please do continue to share questions in the chat. Okay, wonderful. Um, Melanie Taikupa Brown, are you on board? I Brad see you. There you are. Uh, good afternoon. Melanie Taikupa Brown was born into a Bristol Bay fishing family and continues to fish with her children on the site that her great grandfather, Paul Chukon. She winters in Juneau and returns to Naknik with the salmon every year. Melanie, you're on board. Okay, thanks. Hey, before I um, kind of give a little bit of my background, I just wanted to, um, to thank Rudy for um, sharing some of his ideas around bycatch solutions. Um, one thing that I would like to say, Rudy, is that I, I really hope that you, um, you and the other uh, CD, CDQ group members find ways to do whatever you can to apply pressure on the rest of the, like the Amendment 80 fleet and the other trawl fleets that are not part of the CDQ group. If there's a way that you could challenge each other to do, to do more and all that is possible to, to minimize bycatch, um, that leadership that you you um, are able to exert would really mean a lot. I I mean I don't mean to say that I um, I don't believe that you're you're doing everything you can to minimize bycatch, but I think that extremely creative solutions are called for in this situation. Um, yep. So yeah, thank you, Rudy. No, um, thank you. I agree with that fully, and we'll can promise that that we'll be moving that way. Just the, even the fact that we're here having these discussions, I think is a, is a great start. So thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, my, thank you for the introduction, Brad. Um, just to provide a, a little more background. Um, my, uh, my, I'm connected to Bristol Bay through my mother and on my father's side, um, he's from the Norton Sound area and um, has connections as far north as the Kobuk River. My grandfather, Paul Shukan, who was mentioned in my bio, um, he was born in Naknik in a Barabara before the Katmai eruption and the, um, the devastating Spanish pandemic. Um, but he knew that his people came from the Aleutians and um, my great grandmother came over to Bristol Bay with her family from um, Afognak and um, got stuck because of the eruption. Um, and then she lost her parents from the pandemic. Um, so I, I come from survivors um, as all Alaska natives do. Um, but um, I, I am very fortunate to have benefited from the salmon that have sustained my family. Um, and um, I, because of my involvement in the commercial fishery, I was able to to pay for my education um, and graduate debt free. My daughter is now paying for her education with her fishing proceeds. Um, and I participated in the commercial fishery since 1979. And um, 
I, I've always been proud of, of that, but I, I don't think that um, I really, really appreciated the salmon and what they've given my family until the threat of the proposed pebble mine came up. And I, I don't mean to make this a platform for my pebble mine advocacy, but um, I think sometimes we need, we need really stark things to hit us in the face before we really truly value things to the degree that they should be valued. Unfortunately, I think that's just human nature. And we're in that situation right now when it comes to salmon. Um, Bristol Bay is extremely rich and abundant right now with salmon. Um, and I almost feel bad to talk about it, um, about that, when there are people present here who are suffering from lack of returns around the state. But I feel like um, Bristol Bay has so much to teach um, all of us because it is still intact, because it's still so abundant and genetically diverse, because all of the salmon stocks in Bristol Bay are wild stocks. And the cool thing about wild stocks is that um, as long as we take care of the habitat, um, uh, and it, it's, I, I recognize it's hard to control the ocean life of salmon, but we have a better chance if we if we take care of the habitat um, for salmon and um, but the cool thing about wild salmon is that they require no upfront investment or um, planting seeds or hatching they as long as their habitat is taken care of they are able to generate themselves and then we reap the rewards on the other end. Um, so that's why I feel so passionate in my work with Salmon State to, to do the work to protect wild salmon places. Um, but I also think that, um, you know, if it comes down to having to um, inject hatchery fish into river systems that are suffering, I, I truly believe that the brood stock, the rich brood stock of Bristol Bay that's the place to be looking for the genetics to repopulate rivers, river systems that are suffering. You know, if, if, if it gets to that point where uh, broodstock is needed. Um, so, so that, you know, that the habitat lesson of Bristol Bay that Bristol Bay has to teach too, is that it's relatively untrammeled, despite the fact that um, there are uh, a number of villages and communities in Bristol Bay, the road systems are pretty minimal. And so fish passage has not been altered or diminished. Um, or, 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 you know, what, what fish passage may have, may has been, it maybe has been diminished. It's a very small degree, whereas other places in the state, there are development choices that have been made that have impacted fish passage, the, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline and the roadway associated with it. Um, you know, I, I can't help but think that that, you know, that's something that has impacted the, the Yukon um, and, and the Kuskokwim. And I don't mean to say that um, I'm opposed to all development projects, but I think that we, we have to start looking harder at really mitigating impacts of developments. Otherwise, we're going to end up like um, the people on the Columbia River who um, who have a trickle of what's what once eclipsed Bristol Bay salmon runs. We're expecting 71 million fish to return back to Bristol Bay. Those are the projections out of, um, out of the U University of Washington School of Fisheries. Um, so it's phenomenal. Um, so I think uh, an, another thing that we can look at, you know, there's, I, I'm so happy to see all of the food sharing that has been happening uh, around sharing, um, sharing with uh, communities on rivers that didn't get to fish this year. But again, like Doug, Doug Vincent Lang, I would like to emphasize the fact that um, giving salmon to communities who weren't able to catch their own salmon it is no substitution for the cultural connection of gathering and harvesting together as a people. There, there's so much that goes along with that and that a package of salmon is not going to replace. Um, so 
um, it, yeah, and I, I don't mean to, to criticize the food sharing that has happened. Um, I think it's really, really good that, that that has happened, but that is not an end solution. I, and, and that's why I'm bringing it up. We can't stop there. Um, and um, so I, I mentioned the University of Washington School of Fisheries. Um, I think that's another lesson that Bristol Bay can give to the world is, is the, the work, the research that has been done. Um, it, Dr. Daniel Schindler, he, um, he's an intergenerational uh, salmon research scientist. His father started um, salmon research stations um, in Bristol Bay and he continued his father's work and um, he's been collaborating with the BBSRI, which is funded by the Bristol Bay Regional Seafood Development Association. And um, they're doing a lot of really interesting work with otolith sampling and being able to pinpoint exactly wh what river systems and creeks that salmon have come from. And I'm not a fisheries biologist, but I can't help but think that the good research that is being done for Bristol Bay can be applied in other places to help find solutions um, in the research tracks that are being done. Um, so, um, yeah, and I really, I really think, um, so uh, DVL, he brought up um, the sustained yield principle that guides the decision-making around management choices um, for, you know, for how, how rivers, how fresh water is managed in the state of Alaska. And I think that principle has worked really well in Bristol Bay. Um, and I would like to see more of a marriage between the management regime, regime out in the Bristol Bay, or I mean, out in the Bering Sea um, that is under the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Management Regimes. Um, I don't Frankly, I don't understand why um, the North Pacific Management Council has not also adopted a sustained yield principle rather than a maximum uh, sustained yield yield principle. I, I think I'm stating that correctly. I, um, I I just I can't help but think that 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 would really help in minimizing um, how bycatch is impacting the return of salmon to their natal streams. Um, so also, I mean, despite the fact that Bristol Bay is doing so well in terms of its salmon returns, I just, I would really like to see more mind shift when it comes to, um, not thinking of salmon as a commodity. Salmon are a gift and a bean that like, they, they deserve more respect than that. Um, and I guess I'm making reference to the fact that our um, our customers, um, our countries, you know, uh, because the salmon, because the Bristol Bay salmon are so abundant. But it also it it takes away. I feel like treating them as a commodity. It takes away from the respect that they are due, and. Um, I also understand, though, because of the volume, it's, you know, it's hard to treat each individual salmon um, with the utmost respect, but I, I do think that there are ways that we can find balance in, um, in honoring salmon and, and um, the products that are, um, you know, distributed throughout the world. Um, it, I, I would really like to... Um, to close uh, my statements by just by bringing up um, uh, an amazing indigenous leader, Winona LaDuc. I had the honor of hearing her speak at the Just Transition Summit that happened in Fairbanks a couple years ago, not long before we all had to hunker down because of COVID. And she's, she's really involved in um, regenerative agri agriculture around hemp production not pot production, <laughs> hemp production as a fiber um, and as medicine. Um, and um, 
she said that, you know, she's part of this association of hemp farmers who have shifted from industrial agriculture to hemp farming. And the cool thing about hemp is that it's, um, it, it, it sequesters carbon. Um, it, it doesn't deplete the soil in the way that industrial farming does. But one thing that she, she talked about, what she observed is that um, she said that the, the farmers who had shifted from industrial um, scale farming to hemp cultivation were bringing all of their thinking from industrial farming into this new, um, the, you know, this emerging field of um, hemp production. And she, she commented that she couldn't help but think that um, that thinking was going to create the same results that industrial agriculture has caused. And um, she, so she's doing everything she can to try to create mind shift in that realm, but um, she left us with with a, uh, something that um, I I'd like to share with you. Um, it's it's a very potent statement that she said. Um, she said, "Don't make the plant a slave," um, and and I I feel like that's the kind of thinking that um, we need to bring to places where um, salmon are produced into food products or distributed. Um, commercially um, and uh, and be thinking in a more holistic way about sustainability around salmon and um, and um, salmon for the benefit of all I feel like uh, in some ways we made we have made salmon a slave and I don't mean to apply that thinking to uh, traditional and customary users um, but um, we can't be making salmon a slave. Otherwise, we are going to go down a road where we won't have salmon anymore. So I, I'm hoping that we still have time to shift our thinking around salmon. Thank you. That's all I have to say. But I, I you know, I'm happy to take any questions if people have questions for me. Thank you very much, Melanie. I appreciate you carving time out for us today. Um, it's an uncommon day to have an event like this. And uh, um, initially, I was uh, really excited, and I still am. I really, I really love the conversations that we're hosting and facilitating here. And I think it's really important for us to get these messages out. Um, Marissa, what's our time looking like? We're right at 15 minutes. So I think um, there's another question that popped up in the chat. We might hold it uh, for the end if we've still got time, maybe move on to our next panelist. Okay. Thank you, uh, everybody. Melanie, are you gonna are you gonna stick around, Melanie? I will. You're welcome I will. to stick around. Please do. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, Karen Pletnikoff. If you're in the chat room, Karen Pletnikoff is the community environment and safety manager at Aleutians Pribloff Islands Association. Her projects include BIA Coastal Resilience, BIA Alaska Climate Science Liaison, and EPA General Assistance Program Coordination. Did I get those right, Karen? You did. Thanks, Brad. Did I sound okay? All right. Welcome. It's, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, as Brad said, I'm Karen Pletnikoff, and I work for the Aleutian Pribloff Islands Association, and I'm a tribal member of the Aleut community of St. Paul Island. Uh, and a gifted ANCSA shareholder. I've also um, done a little bit of processing and fishing uh, in Bristol Bay for salmon and in my home islands for halibut. Uh, for a, a little bit of a Unanga perspective, an Aleut perspective. Oh, okay, thank you for saying something, Charles. I'll see if I can't uh, crank myself up a little bit. Is this any better? Okay, uh, so um, we, we've uh, continually inhabited our region for 10,000 years. Uh, we uh, have had our own language, culture, and our own approaches to resilience, which have included moving seasonally and uh, decadally even to new sites on all of our islands. All of our islands have village sites that have been re-inhabited over the millennia. Um, 
as the geology, the conditions and uh, the resources shift. Um, our geologically active volcanoes and earthquake prone area um, means that the, the ground beneath our feet is changing and the associated uh, geochemistry or uh, rocks and the water uh, are changing around them as they as they change and and that has uh, been a, um, a source of the growth and the opportunities that we have in our rich waters but it's also may, meant that uh, for instance salmon streams may exist on an island at some point and may completely disappear uh, on another and we make use of that great diversity and abundance in our region to the point of our bodies reflecting that um, uh, marine, uh, the, the ratios of elements and, and the nutritional fingerprints of, of a marine mammal, which we also uh, eat and uh, use for, used for, our, our, uh, for all the resources they provide from bones for the homes to uh, fire, um, oil for fire. And our islands themselves are uh, dependent uh, um, on the marine derived nutrients that are uh, brought uh, up from the depths from by seabirds and have changed the, uh, the entire ecosystem of our islands. And uh, that ecosystem is shifting as we see seabirds dying off in changing environmental conditions. Uh, and change is nothing new for our region. Um, from, the, from the still growing Bogoslav Island that's seeing more and more northern fur seals every year, uh, to the subtle changes in chemistry that I brought up earlier that I'm sure this group knows, knows about with the um, the subtle changes that uh, change conditions and habitat for plants, uh, we see um, the impact on, on salmon eggs uh, being able to thrive and even survive from small changes in, in uh, metals availability. Uh, so we, we are part of our system and uh, in our large and diverse region, uh, salmon fisheries remain prim the primary economy in many of our communities, uh, par par partially due, excuse me, to the permit and vessel size affordability that salmon offers and that we don't see, uh, you know, in the, in the same way, for, for instance, if you could get your hands on pollock quota, uh, being able to afford that permit and that boat would be a, a pretty big um, pull. For many of our communities, the salmon uh, permit and vessel size is something that they could still get into, afford to maintain and uh, pass on to their family. And while this is not my discipline, uh, nutrition or, or uh, food security, my understanding is food security is, is you know, nutritional security now and salmon embodies that nutritional security in so many ways, including uh, the, its distribution and its availability, its shelf life that we can, in our own homes, uh, create the economics of those that access, which is very different for some of our uh, harder to access resources. And especially in the food choices that we have, if we don't have salmon um, in many uh, expensive, low and poor nutritional substitutes. Um, from a health disparities perspective, our food deserts with highly unaffordable protein and fresh food choices uh, are reflected in our health outcomes with disproportional rates of heart disease and diabetes um, and other lifestyle diseases associated with the Western diet. I did want to speak to um, the bycatch discussion that was happening and, and just provide a little bit of context. Um, in the recent numbers that I could find, the commercial take for Chinook, and this is just for one species for an example, but it was brought up. So um, was in 370,000 fish around there. 
uh, as an average over a recent time frame. Sport fish was just under 200,000 in that time frame, and subsistence was about 170,000 in that time frame, with all forms of bycatch, including trawl, at about three, 33,000 um, fish in 2021. Um, and I, I, I believe these are the correct numbers. But I, I just wanted to emphasize that CDQ, um, and, and we could assume that this might be the case with uh, commercial quota entities of other kinds, they really do influence their colleagues um, and they really do uh, reflect a more, the, the, their efforts are reflected in their bycatch numbers, right? So in that year, 2021, the uh, highest Chinook um, bycatch take was in um, a shore side midwater and it was 816 fish. So that compared to the, you know, around 160 that, that Rudy brought up is, you know, is a vast improvement that you can see with their um, mindfulness and uh, frankly, one boat versus multiple boats um, can have. But it's just that bigger um, context that, you know, that the, what, what we can control most about what's uh, impacting our salmon is, is our direct removal? Are those fish that we take that, that get fished? Um, other things under our direct uh, impact are, are the effects of mines and other habitat disturbances that we can choose to do or not choose to do. And, and the, the next step down, the next step away in control um, are our emissions and all of the byproducts uh, about those emissions and all the ways that they impact the system with the warmer ocean waters having their own impacts, the warmer wa river waters having their own impacts. The ability of those warmer waters to carry oxygen is reduced and those impacts hit the eggs, the fry and the adult fish. So at all these life stages and, and Commissioner Vincent Lang brought up how we are starting to see the, you know, these critical life stage, um, you know, just a short time period. If you can just make it now, you can go on to have a successful um, reproductive life. And if, if you miss the window for yourself, if you don't find the right food, if the conditions are too harsh, then, then uh, you're out of the game. Um, and then, uh, all of these things, um, like the acidic waters, uh, they all conspire to reduce um, primary production, which makes less food for the salmon at the zooplankton uh, level. And uh, we see how this uh, uh, reduction in this production at the lower the trophic levels impacts the rest of the system. Some things we have the least amount of control over and, and probably aren't really, um, you know, is, is the volcanoes and the earthquakes and uh, the, the larger climate patterns that aren't driven by our, our emissions. But um, so I, I uh, really appreciate um, Melanie bringing up the success or the, the ongoing um, numbers of, of the Bristol Bay expected returns and how important those returns are. Uh, but I do think we need to note that many fish isn't necessarily better fish, right? These higher numbers might not be um, uh, a good sign if they're smaller numbers, right? Smaller fish individually. These smaller fish are growing slower and that's telling us something is wrong in the ecosystem or something has changed. I mean, right and wrong are, are maybe too uh, amorphized, but the, the <laughs> fundamental productivity is changing. And that's, that's something we really need to think about. People and animals will need more fish if they're smaller and you know, there's a little bit more uh, waste. And uh, the, when fish are smaller, they have fewer, smaller, less successful eggs that could be maybe more likely to wash out in a spring melt. And there could be bigger spring melts with the way um, temperatures have changed. 
Um, so the, the, those kinds of uh, changes in the size and uh, the changes that we're seeing in distributions of, of uh, areas where we're uh, seeing complete failures, uh, disasters, it, it seems, um, in some of the system, specific systems where they're, they're not being successful anymore. Um, these big changes really do need um, a lot of concerted science. Our organization, our re excuse me, our region um, had been excluded from the ground fisheries and the crab fishing mostly in, until uh, CDQ uh, opportunities um, took 10% of the ground fish and, and distributed it to the people of Western Alaska through our CDQ programs. And the same with the way the crabs, uh, crab stocks were uh, uh, shared uh, but th that um, relationship with these larger corporate fisheries, it, it's not a, it's not a, as has been mentioned in the, by others and, and in the chat, it's not a substitute for the, those fish remaining wild, alive, and doing their part for their ecosystem, living their responsibility and being uh, fishable by us in our communities. Uh, and the salmon donations from corporations uh, that shouldn't even have these prohibited species. Um, we, I wouldn't consider it food sharing. Um, it, it's, it's prohibited. I mean, that's the language of the regulations. Uh, these are, uh, something that they need to continually work on. And uh, it's, it's something that when we see how much better uh, motivated vessels can, can do than the, some of the other uh, vessels, when we see that the ties to the communities is reflected in their ability to fish clean, fish well, provide local jobs, improve, uh, um, community investments and uh, sometimes even invest in improved um, value added uh, processing, which improves the value, shows the respect of the, of the uh, resources that, that have uh, given their all to, to, the, um, to our use. That's something that can lift all the boats, right? couple of last ideas. The management equations and assumptions really do need to change. I, I wish Commissioner Lang was here, because, Vincent Lang was here, because he has, uh, you know, real intimate knowledge about these, but the um, increasing uncertainties in, in all of our inputs and, and the fundamental basis for, for these models shifting right from out from under what it used to be. Um, the amount of time at sea that it takes to make a certain kind, the certain size of fish, and the um, the kind of met metabolic rates we can assume in fish are all different. When your temperatures are different, your primary production is different. The food resources that they're relying on is different, and all of these are changing in time. Which again, when we're talking about these little windows of make it or break it. Um, for these species, uh, we need to understand those things more and we need to not uh, sit back and rely on our models that are many of them, uh, you know, 40, 50 years old. But the, the biggest thing that it, it seems that's going on uh, with our fisheries is uh, those interactions that are all related to emissions and, and the way that uh, we know we have things that we can do to change how much carbon we put in the atmosphere and how much that carbon is going to acidify our waters, warm our waters, and, and otherwise change our uh, rich um, resource. And I just wanted to leave on a personal note about how grateful I am for salmon, what it means to me. 
in my uh, life and nutrition, my personal favorite is the gift of a small jar of two-day smoke uh, king, maybe with a couple jalapenos in it, um, because the amount of love and work that it took to catch that special fish, to fillet it, to gather the wood, to build the smokehouse, to smoke it, to uh, clean all the jars and set up the uh, kitchen or, or outside to can it, and then still be willing to share it with, uh, with someone is just, um, wow, amazing. And that's a kind of richness, the talent and the effort that it takes to do that, and the ability to uh, get those resources that can't be, you know, can't be bought at the store. Uh, Well put. Thank you, Karen. Um, I'm afraid we're getting kind of close on time. So we'll ask uh, Brad to introduce the next panelist. You bet. Karen, thank you. You and I can go round and round on a lot of these topics and uh, we have, and I imagine that uh, we'll continue to do so. This is, this is not the end all be all of this discussion here. So um, forgive me for moving on. We've got two more, two more speakers. Harmony Weiner. If you're on board, Harmony Jade Suchak, I think I got that right, Wainer is a member of Naknik Native Village. She's a fifth generation commercial fisherwoman and a marine scientist focused on sustainable rural food systems to promote indigenous values and well being in Alaska villages. She has a Bachelor of Science in Biology from the University of Alaska Southeast, and she's passionate about protecting access to subsistence foods and ensuring the next generation have that access as well. Harmony, are you on board? There you are. Yeah, I am. Um, I need to share my screen. So you I don't know if I can it. just take it over. Okay. okay. Perfect. Can everyone see that? You can. Okay. So I wanted to take more of a personal approach to this discussion because um, often I feel like I live in the intersecting space between science and being a traditional user. Um, and this is me when I was about 10 years old at our SetNet site um, on the Naknik Point where my grandma and great grandma also fished um, the same beach. So I feel a really personal connection um, to this resource, both in the traditional capacity, um, scientific capacity, and uh, commercial capacity. Um, but yeah, Waka, Wina, Aka, Suga, Kasatun, Harmony, Jade, Naknik, Amia, Munga. My Yupik name is Sugak, and my English name is Harmony, Jade. I belong to Naknik Native Village. Um, in my traditional resume, I've been raised in the village of Naknik, Unalaska, Dutch Harbor, and Anchorage, and I'm a fifth generation commercial fisherwoman in the Bristol Bay Sockeye Salmon fishery and I've been fishing for 10 years as a deckhand. Uh, in my Western resume, I have a bachelor's in biology um, and I'm a resource management student currently um, at the University Center of the West Fjords in Iceland, well-being and fisheries researcher, an indigenous fellow for the Arctic or the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, Marine Ecosystems Team, and the vice chair of the Arctic Youth Network. Let's see, it's not letting me change the, um, the slide here. Oh, there we go. So yeah, I've been <laughs> doing this quite a long time. Um, my grandma was the one who taught me how to fish um, at our site. And so, so many scientists don't recognize how they got from A to B. And I'm always trying to be transparent um, about my association with the resource. And so the way I got into it was um, my great grandma, Violet Wilson, told me, whatever you do, protect the fish. <laughs> Mine was more of a mandate about what I should pursue in my career. And as a child, I was raised in a salmon-centric society. Um, as a tribal leader, Alexana Salmon eloquently put, the, the word for food in Yupik is Neka, 
which is the very same word for fish. We are a fish people. It's in our DNA. It's who we are. It's what we do. It's our form of wealth. It knits our social fabric together. It's really the backbone of everything. It's why we need to reduce our carbon footprint. It's why we need to be tied to the land. So just fish, fish being food and food being life. Growing up, we ate fish head soup and a gudak from tundra berries and exclaimed that we're so rich because our wealth comes um, from the commercial salmon fishing industry and also from a full freezer of smokehouse and traditional foods. As elders would say, when you eat subsistence foods, they integrate into your spirit. And like the salmon, you always know your way home. After studying away from home a lot of years, coming back to Naknik in the summers and eating fish from the smokehouse uh, is just something that I treasure so much every year. But on the other hand, growing up, I saw glaring inequalities of the ones who had power over our food system, the management bodies of the state and federal government and the people of my home. How did these people, the scientists make these decisions and did they have any touchstone on what it was like to fish? Did they consider our way of life or even worse, did they think about us at all? And I felt like getting my academic pedigree, I could become one of them holding in my hands two worldviews, that ever encroaching ideology of working from inside the system and trying to change it. But I've strained and struggled to be within the scientific ideology and I feel much as accidental academic coming from a place to really trying to be of service to my community and elevating the voices of um, the people within it. I also recognize the time and support given to me by the Bristol Bay Native Corporation, Nakin Native Village, and like Melanie said, um, the ability to graduate debt-free because of my involvement in the commercial salmon fishing industry. And at the nexus of this experience growing up, as I feel a lot of people from my generation can say, there was a lot of ever looming environmental threats of the proposed Pebble Mine at the headwaters of our fishery. And this ecological pressure coupled with climate change in the Bering Sea and the threat of offshore oil and gas drilling in Bristol Bay, it felt like an assault on all fronts. The environmental anxiety is a detriment to the well being of our communities our ability to practice our traditional way of life. And my own research now in the well being of communities and how food plays into that well being gave me the words to the emotion that I felt as a child, the general uneasiness about our collective future. And well-being is often cited as an indicator of what proper management looks like, but what is well-being in this context? And I think now, like speaking for the younger generation, it's so important to connect people to their place. Um, and that is started by bringing children back to the region, back to their culture and by eating our traditional foods. Uh, so this is some pictures from the first Bristol Bay Native uh, Corporations culture camp this year where I was a camp counselor. I think I skipped a slide. Oh, there we go. So this is just kind of a sum up of uh, the work that I'm doing now for my thesis. Um, having well-being always mentioned as a as an indicator for this management, but what, yeah, what is well being in a fisheries context, in indigenous context overall, um, and all of the barriers that come into that. Um, so, just trying to elevate the voices of the community. Um, and this is building off of the State of Alaska Salmon and People Project. Um, I can put the link into the chat. Uh, but yeah, just a kind of sum up of well being from an Indigenous perspective. And I like the term food sovereignty uh, versus food security because a lot of it is about access 
um, and our ability as a community to um, interpret uh, this access. But everything is a net and interconnected, so that's why I overlaid it onto the net image of uh, my grandma and brother at my site. So again, speaking from reciprocity and going along with some of what the other panelists has have shared, uh, that if we treat salmon respectfully, they'll come back. You protect my future generations, I'll protect yours. So I guess in my perspective, speaking on um, the intersecting space between uh, academic world management world and being a traditional user, trying to integrate uh, indigenous values into management systems starts by not wasting um, and starts by recognizing that we manage the people rather than managing the resource itself. So like in a UPIC perspective, having uh, a hole in, the, in your hand as you take what you need and leave for future generations. So now I'll end um, my statement by the question that uh, I end my interviews with community members on in that how can we ensure a good life uh, for your children's children or your grandchildren? And in my point of view, it's protect the fish and celebrate our way of life, increasing tribal sovereignty as an underpinning of food sovereignty. Yeah, Koyana, thanks. Thank you, Harmony. Um, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm very impressed. Um, you know, no, I'm, 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 I'm at that stage in life. I've just crested 50, and I've got a few more years left, but not, not that many more. And uh, knowing that that our future is in in good hands, such as yours, um, you know, just makes makes me come away from this this event. Um, um, you know, with some added security. Um, <clears throat> I hate to do this to you, but we have to move on. Boyd Solanoff, are you on board? Did we lose Boyd? Okay, we might have lost Boyd, and that's, um, that's unfortunate. Um, Boyd was actually uh, traveling with his family down in Moab, Utah, and he was uh, uh, graceful enough to agree to cut some time out of his day, out of his hike. And uh, I, I tried to talk him out of it uh, into committing to today, but he insisted that that uh, you know this is something that was near and dear to him, and he wanted to express some some uh, some thought on this. So he must have got distracted with the. With the wonderful weather that we must have in Anchorage here, I can't. I'm looking out my front window and I've got blue skies. I don't think I've seen blue skies in, gosh, um, weeks. <laughs> so, um, anyhow, Marissa, do we have any 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 follow-on questions? Now that we've we've got just a few minutes left, I think we've got two minutes left for this chat room. Um, what do we have? Um, I'm just pulling from my recall now. I um, remember one person um, asking about uh, the size of salmon when they are returning to rivers and the trend of that um, going down. If anybody um, has knowledge to share that uh, contributing factors to that trend. Actually, in, in my slideshow, and I, I, I regret that I didn't have a um an opportunity to, to, to share some perspectives. But um, Kyra, if you have my slideshow up um, or available, I don't know if you do or not, probably not. Let's see, there we go. Okay, can you stop right here? Uh, freeze it right here. I wanna, okay, this should lend some perspective to the volume of what Bristol Bay can be like. On the left, one, you've got blue skies and on the right, you don't, right? Uh, that's pretty much the story of my life in Bristol Bay. Um, on the left is uh, the Naknek section of the Naknek Quijack. 
district. And what you see there is what you is it's probably a, a pretty routine hall in the middle of the peak. Okay. Now to give you an idea of what the magnitude of what fishing is like or has been like over in the Nushigak um, section, if you look at the picture on the right, you notice a lot of raindrops on the window, right? Some fish scales maybe. You, you'll also notice uh, uh, what, what stands out. If you're, if, you're a, if you're a keen fisherman, this probably stands out because one, if you look at the reel and you look at how much net is actually on the reel, and you look at the amount of fish in the back of the boat, as well as what's remaining, the net that's remaining in the water, you have an idea just how, how, how thick and abundant uh, you know, the fishing has been over in the Nushigak. Another thing you might notice in the, you know, in the tail end of the boat there where the, the net actually uh, um, proceeds into the water, you'll notice that it's, it, it's not there, it's not visible. It's not there and it's not visible, not because I have a snag, it's not there because it's actually sunk. And um, you know, that, that's, uh, that's one of our extreme days there. You know, those are the days that, that, that you hear about in lore. You know, they're not fishermen's tales. The, the, the picture proves it, so to speak, here. So when I tell you that I did good that day, you can look at this picture and say, okay, must have did good. Um, maybe everybody else did as good. Maybe, maybe people have done better. I don't know. But if anything, this picture illustrates, um, you know, just, just how, um, you know, how, how intense the commercial fishing season in Bristol Bay can be. Now, I don't want to take away from subsistence because subsistence is the heart of this, this conversation. What I take from this, uh, from, my, from my catch, I also bring home. So on, on average, I, I bring home five, 500 fillets, not whole fish, but fillets, 500 pounds of fillets. Let me take that back. So that, that feeds uh, my immediate family throughout the winter. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've got a couple, um, you know, just a couple of fillets left that will take me through Lent. I'm, I'm Lenting right now. I'm Russian Orthodox. It's part of what I do. So uh, again, you know, this, this all, all draws back to the significance of salmon in, in our lives as, uh, you know, as, as people dependent on, on that resource. Salmon is a miracle. It's a miracle because it's, it's a perfect food, if you ask me. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the health benefits of consuming omega-3 are just off the charts. And I, I am a strong proponent of, um, you know, salmon as nutrition, salmon as food security, or as, or, or as Harmony suggests or says, um, food sovereignty. It's a very important element of my life. And everybody who participated today uh, is impacted by salmon and, and its returns in some degree to or another, including Karen uh, Pletnikov uh, out on St. Paul. You know, they're, they're, they're sort of, um, they're the subject matter experts because they see what's going on in the ocean and what's going on in the ocean is what's uh, really impacting um, you know, the, the return of our, our fish back to our, um, back to their spawning grounds. So it looks like we are, we're at the conclusion of our time here. Am I right, Marissa? Yes, I think we're at the, the brink of when we start need to start clearing out and uh, making space for the next panel. I, I apologize. And um, it's very difficult to try to squeeze as much information um, as, as we did today into a, you know, a, a little bit of time. But this is not the end of the discussion. You and I agreed that you know it's great that we've we've begun uh, this initiative, and I'm 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 very much looking forward to remaining part of it, and I can't wait for the for the next event. It's a near and dear subject to my heart, my family's heart, and everybody who uh, who chose to participate today. I would also like to add very quickly that this is recorded, so I do believe that it's going to be available. Um, after, I think a lot of people have banked on having access to this after uh, today's event. So um, anyhow, uh, do you have anything in closing, Marissa? No, just gratitude. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Brad.